Well, I don't really have a introduction prepared, but uh, you know, Carnegie science scientists, they of course will do great science, but they also are doing a lot of other efforts on the side that help to enable that science. And luckily we had a cancellation of our colloquium and Guillermo nicely agreed to tell us about some of the awesome work he's doing, which I've been really interested in. So it's gonna be fun to hear about it uh, firsthand. Uh, so Guillermo's visiting right now from Chile. He's gonna be around through June. So we didn't schedule any meetings with him, but definitely reach out to him. He's on the second floor. I don't remember what office, 217 or something. I'm right across the hall from John. Yeah, so definitely come by and talk with him while he's here. Um, it's a great opportunity. So take it away, Guillermo. All right. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, I'm, I was very glad that this opportunity came up because uh, I think this is a, a very important you know, problem that we have and that we're facing and that it affects a key component of what we do here at Carnegie, which is basically Las Campanas Observatory, which you, I think we, you could fairly say it's, you know, the 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 core of, you know, the 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 unfair advantage that we have as scientists here at Carnegie compared to maybe other institutions that are trying to do research in astrophysics. Um, okay, so, so this is going to be about light pollution. This photo that you're seeing there, this is not near the observatory. This is taken in the Elki Valley. Uh, this is like maybe 10, 20 kilometers away from La Serena. And this is the town of Vicuña down here. This is maybe five or six kilometers away from CTIO and Pachon, where the Vera Rubin telescope is being you know, deployed. So um, and it gives you a sense of you know, the levels of light pollution that you're seeing you know, uh, in, in a site like this. Of course, it's a long exposure. So you know, it looks brighter than what it really looks when you're there, right? And, and you can notice because you, you can still see the Milky Way in the same photograph, OK? Um, OK, so but before we start, I want to start with a lesson of history about uh, uh, an observatory that is very dear and near to us which is Mount Wilson. I assume many of you have been to Mount Wilson or know about Mount Wilson. Um, and I just want to show you this plot and I'll you know, spend some time looking at this. So uh, this is a curve I made, which is super interesting. This, if you go to ADS and you take all astronomy and astrophysics papers from all astronomy and astrophysics journals uh, and you count what fraction of them contain the string Mount Wilson in them, okay? So this, the paper could say this based on data taken on Mount Wilson, or the paper could say this person on Mount Wilson did this or whatever, but it's just a proxy for how scientifically relevant Mount Wilson was in any year, right? As part of the astronomical literature. Um, and you make a plot throughout the whole 20th century. You see that, you know, there's a peak. There was a point in the forties where more than a quarter of all papers in astronomy mentioned Mount Wilson. That is, that's impressive, right? When, when in a whole field, a quarter of the articles that get published mention a facility that tells you how scientifically relevant that facility was, okay? Uh, and then this, of course, you know, at some point went down. Um, and the other curve, the blue curve that you see here, is the, the sky brightness at, my, at Mount Wilson as a function of time, okay? So, you know, there seems, these, these things, things seem to, you know, correlate in, in a negative way, but who knows? Let's understand why. So 1904, I think Hale convinces Carnegie to give him $10 million to build the largest telescopes in the world. You all probably know this story. By the 1908 and 1917, we built the two largest telescopes in the world so far, the 60 inch and the 100 inch. Uh, in the late 10s, Shapley discovers that and shows that the sun is not in the center of the Milky Way. Then in the 20s, Hubble you know, discovers galaxies and discovers the universe basically and shows that the universe is expanding. Um, by the late 1930s, early 1940s, you had people like Bade showing that there are the, there's such a thing as a, a, a called stellar populations and that, you know, stars live in different generations that can affect each other. Um, you know, and by the 50s, you have people like Merrill, uh, you know, showing finally observational proof, undeniable observational proof that chemical elements form in stars. Okay, so this just to give you a sense of, you know, why, you know, a quarter of all articles in astronomy mentioned Mount Wilson. This was an extremely important and relevant place for astrophysics worldwide. Um, but then something happened, okay? And in a matter of 20 years or 15 years, okay, Mount Wilson became a completely scientifically relevant facility. Uh, and what happened basically was that in 1948, the 200-inch telescope uh, was built in Palomar. 
and not in Mount Wilson. Okay? Um, and the reason was this. These are photos. Can we change, can you change the lights or the lights supposed to be like this? Yeah. We have too much light pollution here. Yeah. Yeah. So these are photos of LA and Pasadena as seen from Mount Wilson uh, in 1910. So like a couple of years after Mount Wilson was, was created. And then in 1925, and you can see that there's a huge difference, okay? This is a modern time photograph. Actually, now it probably looks a lot worse than that because it's all full of blue LEDs. And this photo is pre-LED times. Um, so in the early 1920s, Hale decides that Mount Wilson is not a suitable place for the next largest telescope in the world um, because of the increase of light pollution. And a decision is made to start construction in Mount Palomar for a 200 inch in 1928. Okay, so Mount Wilson was considered a possible site, but the main factor was light pollution. There's this, uh, there was this celebration for the 100th years of Mount Wilson, and there's this quote from George Preston, um, who's a, a Carnegie staff astronomer. Uh, many of you know him, many of you don't. Uh, George is still around, he's a great guy. And, but I just want to take the time to read this because I think it's very important. It says, by 1951, Wilson astronomers had come to accept that light pollution in LA and its environments is inevitable. The, those who are concerned with measuring faint objects transferred all their research to Caltech's Palomar Observatory under an agreement between Carnegie and Caltech. Um, so these adjustments produced that basically no remedy for the progressive deterioration that accompanying that accompanied advancing age of Mount Wilson facilities and lack of investment in a polluted site. Um, the accelerated imbalance in demand in between Palomar and Mount Wilson began to wade in in the Carnegie Caltech joint operation. Okay, so light pollution was at the core of what caused the Carnegie Caltech divorce in a way. Um, in the 1960s, Carnegie attempted to solve this basically by developing a dark site in Chile, in Las Campanas. But these two telescopes, the one meter and two and a half meter uh, that we could build in the 1970s, they were not very interested to Car Caltech astronomers. So basically, we stopped working together in the 1980s. Um, and then to fulfill our own, uh, our own need for, for a dark side, we withdrew from Mount Wilson in 85, and we directed all our resources to, to Las Campanas, where we now have the Magellan Consortium, and we are operating two superb six and a half meter telescopes so this is the ultimate legacy of Los Angeles lights. So basically, yeah, basically Magellan and Las Campanas exist because of light pollution at Mount Wilson 80 years before. Go ahead. Excellent. Um, anyway, so I guess the main point I want to make is Something happens in the 1920s and has an effect on what happens in the year 2000, okay? And it's very hard when this was happening in the 1920s for people to really understand the impact that light pollution was going to have on Mount Wilson. So take home message one from this talk is, in the past, astronomical observatories have become scientifically relevant and have been abandoned due to effects of light pollution. You know, this has already happened. And of course, it's something that can happen again. So what's the current situation at LCO, okay? So at LCO, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, you know, what is happening at LCO right now, today, also at other sites in Chile. Uh, I'll talk in this presentation a little bit, bit about the trends that we're observing in the region around the observatory. What are the prospects for, you know, you know long-term prospects for this? And also what efforts we are, you know, undertaking at LCO to promote the protection of dark skies, basically, and, and to protect our site. So the way we usually talk about light pollution or, or, or the tool that we use to you know, say how bad is light pollution in a certain place is something that's called the Bortle scale. Uh, this came from an article in Sky and Telescope by a guy, last name Bortle, maybe 20 years ago. Um, and it's a pretty useful one because basically it defines nine ranges of zenith V-band sky brightness at dark time. Okay, so new moon, dark as possible conditions, what is the surface brightness towards zenith in the V-band, okay? Uh, and it defines nine ranges from what we'll call a natural virgin sky, okay? So a, a, a Bortle scale one site where the 
sky brightness is basically consistent with being at the natural level, which is you know a finite amount of sky brightness, of course. Um, then you have dark sites, and then in 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 scale three, you move into what we call rural sky. So these are basically sky, you know, the average sky you have in the countryside. Let's say, you know, maybe fifty kilometers, hundred kilometers away from from big cities, uh, and then all the way to suburban skies and city and inner city skies. Okay, so inner city skies, city skies, you just can't see stars. Uh, you, you start seeing the Milky Way, you know, in, when you go past suburban skies into rural skies. Uh, and professional astronomical observatories should be, you know, here, ideally. So anyway, this is a map of the sky brightness in the region around Las Campanas Observatory. The red pin is LCO. We're seeing here is La Serena and Coquimbo. And this is Vallenar, okay? Uh, this here is a mine called Pascualama. Okay, it's a it's a gold mine. Okay, so it just tells you shows you how bright mines can be. Um, and this is Domeco and a, a mine that's right next to Domeco called Dos Amigos. It's the closest town we have to uh, Las Campanas. Um, and here you can see that you know the color coding here is based on this uh, kind of ranges of sky brightness. Okay, uh, from following the the Bordel scale. So so that's basically where we sit. Okay, if you turn those sky brightnesses into yes. No, what, the way they do this is that they take nighttime satellite imagery, of right? And then they have a radiative scattering model that takes into account uh, average weather conditions and elevation. And they basically run it, and that translates into a sky brightness at zenith in a different position. Okay, so this is not a direct, you know, there's a, there's a model. This is a model dependent map, basically. Yeah. Um, OK, so you can turn this, uh, this uh, border scale into basically ranges of what we call you know, a fraction above natural brightness. Or, or what, you know, basically, if you take the artificial, the, the level of sky brightness that comes from artificial sources, from arti artificial light at night, uh, you know, how much that increases the sky brightness compared to the natural you know, uh, levels, which is a number that is a lot more intuitive for people than magnitudes per square second, okay? Uh, we have a hard time dealing with magnitudes, let alone the people that actually need to take action on this. Um, so here what you're seeing is that number, okay? And you're seeing the main observatory sites in Chile, so Paranal, Armazones, Paranal is where the VLT is, Armazones is where the ELT is, Chacnantor is where Alba is, La Silla is, our, is an ESO observatory, is our neighbor right next to Las Campanas, then Pachon is where you know Rubin and Gemini uh, are, and CTIO is where the Blanco four meter is. Okay, so you see that you know Parnal, Amazonas, and Chacnantor, and even La Silla, they're all B one. They're all in this like you know first B one border scale category. LCO, sadly, as of the last you know six or seven years, has transitioned into being a B two class site. Okay. Uh, you know, basically we have a measurable amount of artificial sky brightness at Zenith that is about 1% higher than natural, okay? This is actually pretty good. This is like, if I increase the sky brightness by 1%, like you probably won't even notice in your, in the signal to noise of your observations, okay? So this is still a very dark site, but there's, there are measurable levels of light pollution at the site, which we didn't have maybe a decade ago, okay? Um, and then Pachon is at a 4% and CTIO is at a 6% above uh, natural sky brightness. So 10% so, so gets you to B3. So but CTIO is basically on its way towards becoming a B3 site maybe within the next decade. Yep. Speaking about, I mean, I guess it's close, but I mean, I can see the CEO and I can see is there a reason why the CEO is close? Yeah, it's basically further away from Domeco. So this Domeco, this is us, and La Silla is like over here. Uh, so it's, I think it's the distance to, to this town that makes a difference, right? And also we are right at the, I mean, the numbers are very similar, right? The third is typically like 0.02, right? So, so, you know, like 
this like Paranal or Masonic Techno and Tor, they're like within the air bar. Uh, and, and we are, yeah, close within the air bar. But, but I think uncertainty is mostly systematic also. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I'm, I'm not familiar with details of, you know, like exactly every, you know, uncertainty that goes into this satellite imagery and these models. Uh, but what the quote people quote is typically like one to 2% uncertainty. Uh, I don't know. It's I'll I'll show you I'll show you a little later. Yeah. Okay, so at LCO, this is a photo taken from the outside Magellan uh, at LCO, looking towards the west, okay, towards the ocean. Uh, so the main sources of light pollution at LCO are La Serena, so that's a big halo, uh, and Vallenar, okay, which are these two big cities, this Vallenar here and this La Serena, okay. The other uh, source is uh, this, you know, you see that whitish light there? Is that this Dos Amigos mine, okay? The light is a different color. It does just have a lot of whitish LED lighting. Um, and something that is, I mean, it's not new for, I guess, most of you, but for us was very new at, the, at some at a moment was, you know, all these lights that you see that are basically along the Pan American Highway. Um, that, those lights were all installed and turned on after, you know, in 2015. Okay, so this is a, 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 a nighttime satellite imagery image. Uh, this not sky brightness, but the actual lights on the ground on 2014 and 2016. Okay, and you see all those lights are new, uh, and that was because they were basically they redid the highway and they installed lights all uh, across, along the highway. Um, so those are the main sources of light pollution at our site, and this goes to show how individual infrastructure projects can have a big effect on top of the like kind of slow growth of cities. So take home message two is LCO remains a very dark site. We have like four to six times less, you know, light pollution than sites like Pachon or CTIO, but it suffers from measurable levels of light pollution. Okay, we can actually measure it and see where it's coming from. Uh, unlike other sites like Paranal, Amazones, and Chacnantor. Okay, so that's the current state of affairs at Las Campanas. So let's talk a little bit about trends. You know where things are going. So when you look at long baseline nighttime satellite imagery, you see that basically cities and urban centers in you know across the Atacama Desert in the north of Chile, they, they have been getting brighter and brighter every year at a typical rate of two to four percent. Okay, two to four percent per year. Um, this is an example. So this is. Uh, you know, there's this tool called Light Trends. Dot light. There's this tool called the Light Pollution Map. Uh, and there's, they have this, this really nice tool called Light Trends, where you can actually define polygons on a map and make basically get like the measurements you know, over time. And it's super interesting to use. You can use it in different parts of the world. Um, so this is a box around La Serena and Coquimbo. Again, the pin is where LCO is. And what you see basically is that uh, you know, since 2012 through 2023, we have, uh, if you look at the slope of the curve, that's roughly a 4%, 3.8%. 4% you know, yearly increase, okay? Um, this is a polygon uh, along the highway, and you see the jump from when they install the lights on the highway, okay? And then a decrease that, that we think or suspect is associated with basically uh, dust building up on the lamps themselves, and also you know, the, the LEDs becoming less bright as they age, okay? Um, all, I mean, also we have worked a lot, tried to work a lot with highway to, you know, bring some lights down at toll plazas and, and things like that. And they're being good and sometimes they're having been great some other times. Uh, but it just shows you how like a single infrastructure project can like completely change the light pollution environment of an area in the desert. Okay. Um, now, there's a lot of evidence lately that this like two to four percent yearly increase, which actually matches what we see in most places of the world, like two, three, four percent yearly increase. There's a lot of evidence now that this could be seriously underestimated by factors of several, uh, although there's uncertainty on that. Um, and that is due to the popularity of solid state LED lighting, okay? Uh, especially, you know, the early introduction of LEDs was mainly using cool white LED lights, so light that has a very strong blue component in their spectra, 
Um, and that is not covered by the satellite, nighttime imagery satellite bandpasses that we have to monitor light pollution over long baselines, okay? So we're suffering a blue light invasion. This is a photo of La Serena and Coquimbo there. That's the Coquimbo Peninsula with a cross, you know, the big cross. Um, so, so all the yellow lights, you know, they're old high pressure sodium lights. And this is a spectrum of a high, uh, high pressure sodium light, okay? So it's very much focused on the or yellow, orange, and the red, okay? Um, but you see now, and this will happen in any city in the US also, anywhere in the world where you look, now it's full of these whitish lights, okay? So those, that's LEDs, those are, you know, cool white LEDs. And, you know, LEDs come in different flavors. It's not that LEDs are, you know, per se terrible in terms of emitting a lot of blue light. Um, but if, you know, when you buy an LED, you know, there'll be something called the, the correlated color temperature. Um, you know, and the, the higher, the bluer they are. And the way these things work is that they have a, a yellow peak and a blue peak, okay? Uh, and the blue and the and the ratio between the blue peak and the you know red peak or yellow peak basically you know tells you how warm or how cool a white light LED is. Um, there are these things now called amber LEDs where you know basically it's completely you know suppressed and, and they're actually pretty good for for our purposes. But basically we have been installing these things everywhere in the planet. Um, and if you look at the spectrum of uh, of like the old high pressure sodium lamps and the spectrum of the LEDs and the bandpass of the VIRS day night band, which is the main you know, nighttime imaging satellite data set that we have that is kind of uniform and has a very long decades uh, you know, baseline, which is what all these maps that I've been showing you are based on. Uh, it cuts off at 5,000 angstroms basically, and it does not include this peak, okay? So with this transition to LED, we have not been able to map, okay? So what people have done, and this is a really nice paper, Kaiba, 2023, it came out last year. Uh, there's this uh, citizen science program run by Noir Lab, it's called Globe at Night, where they ask people all around the world to go out with a printed star map and just mark which stars they can see and which ones they cannot, okay? And they have done, they have like tens of thousands of measurements taking over uh, more than a decade with you know thousands of volunteers all around the planet doing this. It's a really nice program. And this allows you to calculate what they call the NELM, which is the naked eye limiting magnitude. What is the faintest star that people can see with their naked eyes? And that, of course, depends on sky brightness. So the plot on the left is, shows you the, the, measure, the naked eye you know, limiting magnitude you know, as residual with respect to what you predict from the trends that we see in the satellite imagery. Okay? And there's a clear bias uh, that you can correct if you assume that the increase, instead of being two to three percent a year, has been more, has been closer to ten percent per year. Okay, and so basically, it's a way in which we we can estimate what the real increase has been due to this transition to cool white LEDs, basically. Okay, so really, you know, the interests are more in the seven to ten percent uh, increase per year, which is massive. It means like in a decade, you have two times more light. Okay, it's it's pretty bad. The other thing is mining activity. So mining activity in the Atacama Desert continues to grow. Something that is super important to understand is that mining in Chile accounts for 25% of the country's you know, GDP uh, and 10% of all countries' tax revenue. Okay? Chile has developed a national development strategy that is based on being the largest producer in the world of copper and lithium, okay? Copper means coils, cables, transmitting, and producing energy. Lithium means batteries, okay? So if we want a transition to a society that doesn't use fossil fuels, and we wanna have things like electromobility, you're gonna have to increase your production of copper and lithium enormously, global-wide. And this is the political, you know, a strategy that both the right and the left and everybody in Chile has. It's like, we are the champions of climate change. We're gonna mine as much copper and lithium as we can, and we're gonna save the world, okay? Uh, and we're gonna become a developed country while doing so, okay? So there's no fighting this, really. There's no uh, reasonable world in which astronomers can 
you know, you know, put a hold on the, you know, on the increase of mining in the Atacama Desert. It's really hard. So it's something we need to live in and mitigate and work around. This map is the same, same type of map I was showing you before, but it shows the Antofagasta region. This is further north from where LCO is. Here you see Paranal and Armazones. This is where the VLT and the European ELT are being built. And this is Chaknantor. This is where ALMA is. Okay, and other, there are other infrared and optical telescopes there as well. Um, what's interesting about this is that there are, only, there are only four cities in that map. Okay, have Antofagasta there, which is a city the size of Irvine or something like that. Uh, Mejillones, San Pedro de Atacama, which is a very famous tourist destination. Okay, and the bottom part of this tumble sort of source is Calama. The top part is a mine that's called Chukicamata. And all the other ones are mines. Okay? That one is La Escondida. That is the largest copper mine in the world. Okay? And it's actually brighter than the largest city in the region. Okay? So the problem with mines, and what's scary about mines, is that they're super bright. They work 24 7, right? They just have the full operation at night, they don't stop. Um, but also, they can pop up anywhere. It's unlike a city where you know where they are and you can kind of predict how it's going to evolve over decades, a mine can just appear and disappear. Okay, and that's very scary. Like if one of these mines were to get installed near LCO, that would be a problem. So, thinking of prospects, when you take this ten percent yearly increase and you say, "Okay, where are we today?" You know, in this plot of scientific relevance, you know, versus sky brightness, right? For Mount Wilson. That, is, of course, is, is a stretch to extrapolate it, but, you know, the best we have. Um, this is where LCO is today. And this is where we think LCO, with this 10% yearly increase, is going to be by mid-century, okay, in the 2050s. And, and, and at first, you may look at this and say, yeah, that's, that's not too bad. But then if you remember that in the early 1920s, right, Hale decided not to install the 200-inch at Mount Wilson because, you know, light pollution didn't look like it was evolving in the right direction, it's a little scary, right? Uh, the, like in the past, astronomers have decided to start abandoning professional astronomical observatories because of seeing those levels of light pollution. Okay? This is, these are the prospects for, C, for CTIO, uh, right? With their current level of light pollution and how bright it will be 20 years from now, okay? This is actually, you know, pretty bad more than half, half a magnitude of increase in sky brightness in the optical. So take home message number two is light pollution in Atacama is increasing at an alarming rate, I would say. Um, and it is identified as one of the greatest long-term risks to the scientific operation of our observatory, of the GMT, and of other facilities that are being installed in Chile, you know, like Rubin and the European ELT, uh, you know, and other big telescopes like Gemini, the VLT, the Blanco, et cetera, okay? Uh, so it's, it's a real problem and the prospects are not promising. Yeah? So last part of the talk, what are we doing about this, okay? So we have, um, we have been undertaking efforts locally in Chile for dark skies protection for a long time. Uh, most of our efforts are focused on two organizations, two different organizations. Um, there's a thing called the OPCC that stands for the Office for the Protection of the Night Sky in the North of Chile. It's a terrible acronym. Um, it's, uh, but, but anyway, uh, but it, it's basically a technical office that resides inside Noir Lab uh, in Aura. Okay? They're based, it's based in La Serena. He has two FTEs, there's two people basically working in this office. Uh, one position is currently vacant, so we're actually gonna be looking for a director for the OPC soon. Um, and this office, as I said, is, is a technical entity, okay? So it focuses mainly on defining technical best practices for sustainable illumination. Uh, they have provided a lot of technical support to the government, to the Ministry of Environment, et cetera, to define you know the parameters that, and and the, and the uh, that the that the regulation should have in terms of what technical characteristics the lights need to have, how they should be measured, certified, etc. Um, and they can also have they have the ability to design 
illumination projects, uh, you know, for for a municipality or something, or to provide, you know, uh, you know, help in designing projects uh, for a highway or a park or a football field or whatever. Uh, so as I said, it, it's it's the, this office, which has existed for more than twenty years now, has played a key role historically in you know pushing regulation forward and and helping in the effort. But the focus has been mostly technical. Okay? Um, there's this other organization called the Fundación Cielos de Chile or Skies of Chile Foundation. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention. So, so OPCC is, is resides in Sard Noir Lab, but it's jointly funded by Aura, LCO, or Carnegie, basically, uh, ESO, and the GMT. Okay? Um, the Skies of Chile Foundation or Fundación Cielos de Chile is a is a is a nonprofit organization in Chile. Um, it's jointly funded by Carnegie, ESO, and the GMT project. Uh, it also has two FTEs, and it was created fairly recently, four years ago, in 2019. And the realization was that we needed, you know, uh, uh, someone to take care of the other aspect of the fight against light pollution, which is basically awareness, education, you know, public policy, lobbying, etc. Okay. Um, so the goal, the mission of the foundation is to basically raise awareness of the value of star skies uh, and the negative impacts of light pollution, which is mainly by education outreach programs and by also engaging the community, the local community, and, and, and trying to also catalyze support for initiatives that other actors in the ecosystem, universities, municipalities, et cetera, are trying to push forward. Um, and we very also work a lot in trying to engage the authorities, you know, in you know terms of taking action and, and improving public policy. So uh, today I'll just tell you a little bit about what the foundation does. Um, we can also talk about the, what the OPCC does, but this is basically where I spend most of my time working on uh, the fraction of my time that I spend on this. So this is the board of the foundation. Uh, um, I have the honor of being the president of the board. We have representatives from, you know, ESO. Luis is the the is the head of ESO in Chile. Uh, Oscar Contreras, Luis Chavarria. Oscar Contreras is the, is the representative of the GMT project in Chile. And Polo, you all know, is the director of Las Campanas. Um, Stefan and Eleonora are also, you know, high-level management astronomers uh, at, at Paranal. Um, and we also have you know, a, a group of collaborating members um, in the board of foundation. So Mark and Miguel, many of you know, they're both former Carnegie astronomers and former directors of Las Campanas and Miguel, former representative of the GMT in Chile. We have Barbara Rojas, who's the representative of the Chilean Astronomical Society. Um, and Gabriel Rodriguez, who's a, a former ambassador, uh, a former Chilean ambassador who was for many years the head of the science division of the Ministry of Foreign Relationships, which is basically the main contact point between the observatories and the government of Chile. Um, so all of these people basically dedicate you know, a fraction of their time. We meet every two months to kind of design a strategy and what to, how to move forward on projects and things. We have an executive team at the foundation. Daniela Gonzalez is the exec executive director of the foundation. And we recently hired a second person, Juan Pablo Valenzano, to help her coordinate projects. Um, but basically, you know, these are the two people who are on the ground full time, you know, doing all the work, basically. Um, and I want to highlight, you know, just to talk a little bit about the work that we do, I want to highlight two big wins that we had during 2023, uh, based on work that was pushed from the foundation. One is, was the declaration by part of the Chilean government of something that's called protected areas for astronomical research and observation. Okay, that's the best translation from Spanish to English. This is a new figure in the Chilean environmental legislation. It was created back in 2019, and we also had a big role in, you know, pushing Congress to modify the main environmental, you know, protections act to include artificial light as a pollutant and to in create these areas uh, or the figure for these areas. But it took four years for the government to actually declare the areas and say, okay, these are the areas, okay? So now the Ministry of Science has declared what these areas are based on a, the outcome of a, a commission, an expert commission that basically said like, you know, you should protect everything within 150 kilometers from the main astronomical observatories uh, in the Atacama Desert. Uh, and this implied lobbying efforts over two presidencies and four different science ministers. So. 
And every time you know the, 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 the minister change, it was going again and talking to all new people and all new teams and trying to push the thing up uh, the process, but we finally got it to work. Um, so this year we had this declaration come up. So here you're seeing where we are, LCO and GMT. Um, this is Aura, the southernmost, and this is Chakrantor and, and Parnal, the northernmost. And all these municipalities are basically intersect uh, 150 kilometer radius at some point of their territory with, you know, this, the, with the circles that are centered on the observatories. Uh, and they're declared prote protected. Okay? And this has two main impacts. One is that any big project that has to go through an environmental assessment and EPA approval, basically, uh, has to evaluate their impact in light pollution and propose mitigation strategies as part of that report, which didn't have to happen before. Um, and it also had a second impact, which is related to the second win we had, which was a complete revision of the national light emissions standard or regulation. Uh, we had a former, you know, the, the former norm that we have for kind of protecting ourselves from light pollution only applied in the Antofagasta, Atacama, and Coquimbo regions, only applied in the north, near the observatories, in those territories. Uh, it, it required full shielding, so no light above the horizon, uh, and it allowed a 15% maximum blue light. So there's a, a wavelength range that is, you know, the, the, where, you know, the fraction of light in, the, in that wavelength range that corresponds to basically this blue LED peak, you know, was a maximum of 15%. So, and that accounted for like 3,000 Kelvin LEDs were allowed. Anything warmer than 3,000 Kelvin LEDs were allowed. Um, that was not great because that is much worse than high pressure sodium, which is what we had before. Okay, so, so it didn't really help that much. Um, it required the lining fixtures to be certified. It regulated, you know, sports centers, policing boards, et cetera. But it was a good norm, but it had a very, very low compliance levels. Okay. Uh, very few people knew, even knew about the norm, uh, let alone the government didn't have any, you know, capacity to enforce it or, 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 or go and look and check and sanction people. Um, so this, this norm has been fully you know, revised. Uh, and the new norm, which was published a year ago, but it came into effect this year, the new norm applies to the whole country. This is related to the realization that light pollution also has a very important impact on human health, on biodiversity, et cetera, something I've not talked about, but we can talk about that also. Um, and this is very good because it will increase the level of awareness and knowledge that a norm exists, right? Because Chile is a very centralized country. Half the population of Chile lives in Santiago. If something affects Santiago, the country knows. If something doesn't affect Santiago, basically very few people know. Um, so it, it, it has two levels of regulation. The whole of Chile will now only allow up to 2,700 Kelvin LEDs for outdoor lighting. Uh, and the protected areas, they're gonna, you're going to be required to have a 1% maximum of blue light, which is basically enforcing amber LED lighting in all these municipalities within 150 kilometers of, yeah. Is this going to be retroactive or is this going to be phased in uh, going forward? So inside the protected areas, there's a five-year time period for the renovations to happen. Outside of the protected areas is whenever they need to be replaced. So whatever is installed now stays until it needs to be replaced, basically. Um, you had a question? It's the same. Yeah. So the other important thing is that besides requiring the outer lighting fixtures to be certified, it establishes import restrictions. Okay, so that means that you're not going to be able to import outdoor lining fixtures to the country that don't meet this 7% of blue light criteria that should apply to the whole country. So we're hoping that this is going to make a big difference in the compliance levels, right? Because we're, it's pretty hopeless to hope for the government to control this on the field, you know, like the Ministry of Environment and the, the you know, the, 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 the agencies that are supposed to check, control this on, you know, and enforce this, right, in, in the territories. They're focused on smog and chemicals in the water and mining residuals and you know nuclear waste and other things that are not light pollution. Okay? And they don't have resources to do this. So these import restrictions we're hoping will be very important. Um, so those are two wins we had. I just want to also tell you a bit of what we're doing on the on the education side, on the awareness side, okay? Because those are all like lobbying with politicians and like 
trying to change public policy and the regulatory scheme of things. Uh, but until people don't care about this, and no, I mean, most people don't even know what light pollution is. They don't even know that it affects them. They don't even know it's there. And until people care about this, it's very hard to get governments to actually care and do something about it. Um, so some, we are adopting a role where we're trying to lead the education and communication for this new light emissions norm. Basically, when we go and talk to the Ministry of Environment of the, uh, in Chile, they basically say, yeah, we passed the norm. We have zero budget and zero resources allocated for communication, right? We're not gonna communicate this like to the public in any way. So we don't have money or people you know, for this in our budget. So we are, we're trying to take this role and we, we recently hired a communications agency called Innata Media uh, to basically produce a communication strategy for the foundation where the main focus is gonna be you know, raising awareness about the existence of this law and the need for people to comply by it, you know, for all actors to actually comply by it. Um, the other thing we're doing is we associate ourselves with a center in Santiago called CIPIX. It's the Interdisciplinary Center for Sustainable Construction and Productivity. But it's basically, uh, it's like a think tank for sustainable construction. And they have, they offer courses and a lot of people who are in the business of architecture, construction, city planning, urbanism, et cetera, they take their courses as part of their continuing education programs, et cetera. Uh, so we have developed a course on basically how to make sure your projects, your you know, real estate projects, your construction projects comply with the light pollution regulations in the country. And we're offering this course. Uh, so that's you know, a, a, another way in which we're trying to get at the root of the problem, okay? Like you know, basically, there are like few actors, you know, in the lighting industry, in the construction industry, et cetera, that if you manage to get to them, you can prevent a lot of problems downstream, basically. Um, and the last thing that we're doing that we just launched a couple of weeks ago is a citizen science platform called Glowwatch, which is something that actually anybody can use anywhere in the world. But it's basically a, a, a tool to record and geolocate light pollution sources. So basically what we developed is uh, WhatsApp bot. I know WhatsApp is not that popular in the US, but in Chile basically, and most, almost I guess in every other country I've been, people use WhatsApp as you guys use text messages. Okay, so, so it's like, it's the main way people communicate with each other. Uh, so everybody has WhatsApp on their phones and everybody uses it, at least in Chile. Um, so basically you can use uh, your WhatsApp, this bot on WhatsApp to feed a database of geolocated sources of light pollution, okay? And the way this works, oh, this is, sorry, let me just play you this before. So this is our launch video that we put together. Uh, are you, uh, I don't know, that's fine. This is Spanish, but. Sabías que un niño que hoy ve 250 estrellas de noche solo podrá ver unas 100 en 18 años? Las enormes cantidades de luz que emiten las ciudades están generando un desperdicio energético y lumínico que impacta directamente en nuestra salud, la biodiversidad y el patrimonio astronómico. Por eso, como embajadores de la iluminación sustentable, en Tu Buena Luz decidimos actuar y hacer un llamado a bajar la intensidad y difundir el cuidado de los espacios exteriores. Presentamos Glowwatch una nueva herramienta para reportar casos de contaminación lumínica y generar un cambio sostenible en el tiempo. Cuidemos la luz y devolvámosle el brillo natural a la vida. Te invitamos a ser parte de nuestra comunidad y reportar tu caso en nuestra web. Es tarea de todos que nuestros hijos puedan vivir y disfrutar de un entorno libre de contaminación lumínica. Glowwatch. So that's basically the the media that we're using to launch this and like on social media and the web and everywhere. Um, this is a collaboration with another foundation that basically is made of architects and light designers that care about this and CATA, which is one of the main astronomy centers in Chile. Um, and the way this works is basically that you pull up your phone, you look for Glowwatch, the, which is a contact you have on WhatsApp and you say hi and you'll start asking you questions and it basically asks you uh, what kind of you know, problem you want to report, or, you know, is, is the light shining on your eyes? Is the light, is the problem the color of the light? You know, is the problem 
that the light is going inside your house, like, and you just reply a number, you just choose an option. And then it asks you where it is, you know, is it a, a, a home, uh, is it a, co a, a commercial center, is it just the street, is it a stadium or, or whatever. Then you just, you know, answer another number. And it, then it asks you to take a photo of it and to share your location, right? And that is all the information we need to feed a database, right? And geolocate the sources. It will also ask you to do a, like a, to write a small report, but you don't need to write it, in, you know, because people don't like spending a minute, you know, writing a couple sentences. It's just like too much work, right? So, so basically, we just want you to hit, you know, use your fingers the least possible, uh, and you can basically end up populating this map, right? That is geolocated to the GPS precision of your phone, basically, uh, of light pollution sources, right? And and what and you can search this database by what type of problems uh, you're causing or time of the year or whatever. So, so this mostly we envision it as a citizen science platform that would allow, let's say, uh, an educator at a school to do a education program with, you know, a bunch of kids and, you know, ask them to report, you know, uh, light pollution sources in their neighborhood. Uh, but also the government is interested in it and they have expressed their interest in it in having their people that need to check for these things, basically use this as a tool to build a database of infractions to the light pollution norm, okay? So, so anyway, we, as I said, we just launched this last week and we are working on implementing several programs to increase the, using, the, the usage of the tool. Uh, lastly, the other thing we have is we are implementing an, a monitoring program of the Environmental Evaluation Service Projects database, so whenever Let's say a mine wants to, you know, start a build, say someone wants to build a mine or a port or a highway, right? Uh, at some point, a folder goes to the uh, environmental evaluation service with, you know, uh, with the environmental assessment report, basically, or environmental impact study, okay? Um, we need to be monitoring the incoming projects all the time and making sure that first, whether if they are complying with the regulations, right? Uh, and if they're not, we have there's there are these very well defined periods of like 20 or 60 days for people to complain about the projects and and make observations to the projects. Uh, so we are setting up a system where we have a constant monitoring of the influx of large infrastructure projects that are going into for environmental assessment in the country, uh, especially focusing in the regions near the observatories. And we have recently restarted conversations with the company that operates the highway. So it's a private concession for the operating this highway near Las Campanas. We were this close of striking a deal with them back in 2020 uh, for changing the lights on the highway and putting amber LED everywhere, uh, which now they're gonna have to do anyways, but we wanted them to do it as early as possible. Uh, but then the pandemic came and basically, you know, Everybody's priorities shifted, and we're we're working on on restarting this. But we, we basically this is our main short-term goal: is trying to get those lights changed for amber LEDs that are compliant with the new norm as soon as possible. Hopefully, before the five-year period that the law allows. Um, and to finish, I just want to mention this very quickly because I think it's interesting for people to kind of understand the scale of the problem and the scale of the resources that we're spending on them. The Foundation budget is 160K a year. This comes mainly, half of it comes from ESO, and the other half comes from uh, Carnegie and the GMT. And when I say Carnegie, really, you know, a lot of it comes from the Magellan Consortium. So it's not just us, but also our partners, you know, in the Magellan Consortium. Um, but this is the level of resources that we are spending on the problem, okay? So, and, and this is not just us. We look at ESO or Noir Lab or GMT or, you know, the other big observatories in the country, they're basically at very similar levels. Um, so observatories like us, we're typically spending less than half a percent of our operations budget, of our yearly operations budget on light pollution control efforts. Okay? Um, and it's the kind of thing where, you know, you put this in the budget, the resources that you're spending versus the severity of the problem. Uh, and you typically want to sort of balance that, but it's a long-term problem. Right, it, it's it's not as short term as you know fixing the electronics on the IMAX F4 camera, right, or whatever. So, um, but it's it just gives you food for thought, you know, of like you know is this level of investment 
in protecting our sites where we are building billion dollar telescopes uh, and infrastructure projects sufficient or not. Okay. And so take home message four and final, I think. Well, actually there's one more. LCO and the other observatories where we have a coordinated dark skies protection effort. Uh, we have had great progress in improving regulation. And now we're shifting our focus a lot to education and raising awareness, okay? And trying to get the compliance levels with these new norms, you know, to be better. Um, and also optical and IR observatories in Chile, we typically spend less than half a percent of operations budget on this sort of efforts, okay? That's the, the amount of resources that we're putting into the problem. So the final take home message is that, you know, this is the full, uh, you know, area of interest, you know, in the north, in northern Chile, that's Antofagasta there, that's La Serena and Vallenar and Copiapó. This is where we are and La Silla, this is where Pachón and CTIO are. You see how they have a bit much bigger light pollution problem than we do. And Paranormal Amazonas are in an extremely dark site, you know, really, really dark site. Um, but the point is that the Atacama is no longer a desert in the middle of nowhere, like it was back in the 1950s and 60s when Carney astronomers decided to move there. It's actually a region that is developing very quickly. Urban growth is increasing, mining activity is increasing very fast. Uh, and if we don't act now, in 50 years time, it could look like this other desert that you're all very familiar with. You know, this desert that extends between LA and San Diego and Phoenix and Las Vegas, right? Where Mount Wilson is and Palomar and Lowell and Kid Peak, okay? So we wanna, we need to find a way of preventing this place to turn into this place because that's basically where we're heading you know and that's where we're, the world is heading you look at you know the talk we had uh, last week on how human population growth is increasing exponentially and you can easily see how we're heading in this direction so anyway that's all i have and thanks yep so what do we know about the proven thanks great talk what do we know about the proven uh, metal deposits in the areas around our components do we know like when the next x mine are most likely going to pop up yeah so basically what we do is we have very limited protection against mining in the sense that Within our property, so our property is like 20,000 hectares. That's like 40,000 acres or 50,000 acres, okay? Uh, with around the mountain. Within the Carnegie property, uh, that property is protected by law, by a presidential decree, as a, basically a no mining zone. Okay, so anybody, the, where, the way mining rights work in Chile is that people who own the mining rights don't necessarily have to be the owners of the land, right? If you find, gold or petrol under somebody else's land you can claim those mining rights and you can you know and they need and if you do things right they need to give you access to exploit those mining rights right uh, so within our property there's a presidential decree that protects it and this happens also for the other observatories and you cannot do exploration nor extraction without or, nor claim you cannot do exploration or extraction without an authorization from the president of the republic which is basically impossible Okay, uh, but you can claim mining rights. Okay, so what we do is every year we spend a few thousand dollars in hiring uh, an attorney that makes sure that we own all the mining rights in our property. Okay, so we claim all those mining rights for ourselves so we don't exploit them. Okay, now that's a problem now because they want to change. The, a lot of people have played with uh, speculating with mining rights around the country, so they want to change the law so you cannot claim mining rights if you don't exploit uh, exploit them. So, but anyway, that's what we do now. But that is just fifty thousand hectares. Well, sorry, fifty thousand acres. Okay, so that is maybe I don't know five kilometers that way and five kilometers that way. Okay, um, and outside of that, we didn't used to have any protections. Okay. Um, now, with the creation of these protected areas, we hope that that's gonna give us a better level of protection in the sense that if a mine was, were to install itself, say, 20 kilometers away from the observatory, 
um, they would need to assess their impact. Okay? And if a good case is made that that impact is impossible to mitigate and has this you know, very terrible effect on this protected area, you could get that project stopped at the, at the government level. Okay? But that is, depends a lot on things like how this is actually implemented by the Environmental Protection Agency and a lot of on the political mood of the times. Okay, depends on what who's in charge of the, you know, like the EPA didn't work the same when Trump was the president than when you know Obama was the president, right? So, you know, it's, it's still it's still a very risky, you know, situation in which we're in. Are you saying that the essential part of the in environmental impact assessment that has to be done before a mining is established, operating is started? Yes. It has to involve the stakeholders, mm -hmm. i.e. the observatory, if it's going to affect the operation. Is that a, requ a legal requirement? That it, is a legal requir it is a legal requirement for, as part of the environment environmental assessment and authorization, they need to present a study where they, you know, basically they need to measure you know, a, a, you hire a consultant that is a specialist that would measure the impact. They'll measure the current situation, the impact, and you know, propose mitigation strategies to mitigate that impact. And they need to do this regarding biodiversity and water resources and archaeological heritage. And and now they need to do this in, in terms of light pollution, which was not the case, right? So that, that's basically the point at which we're at now. Testing. All right. Um, is there more questions? There, go ahead. Here, go ahead. Please use the microphone for yeah, people sure. online. So we moved from Mount Wilson to Palomar. I mean, do we have anywhere else to go if if uh, the Atacama I, Desert becomes brighter? I mean, it seems like a very universal problem. So sure, Mauna Kea. That's okay. easy. <laughs> the build telescope there, right? Right. Um, basically, I mean, the, I think the problem right now is. We don't have, I mean, there are dark places where you could go. Namibia is, a, you know, like some a place where like people are thinking of putting telescopes in and it's super dark, uh, right? You, you probably have to wait another hundred years before, you know, you run into this problem in Namibia instead of Chile just because of the kind of growth of the GDP of the country or whatever. Um, but there are no sites with such good conditions. So I, I think we're we are heading against the wall where all the darker sites that you could go to are not as good, right? I mean, when you look at you know the, the site selection reports for TMT and GMT and you know all the, the ELTs, right? They basically are pretty comprehensive in terms of exploring place, you know, sites. Um, and it's really hard to find better sites than Las Campanas. Uh, or or Parnell or Chaknantor, right? So it's not it's, it's it's not an easy thing. Also, the level of investment and and resources that you require to develop new sites, you know, makes projects like projects are already so expensive that the NSF can't afford to build them, right? Or or that you know that the federal government can't afford to 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 fund them. Um, so if you add, start adding things like we're going to abandon all our operation, right? In in Chile, say like say Noir Lab, right? Noir Lab has, you know, hundreds of people working in La Serena. We're we're a much smaller operation than Noir Lab or ISO, but Noir Lab and ISO have a level of infrastructure and administration and networks and you know, uh, not only at the sites at the mountains, but also in the city in the town that it will be super expensive to abandon, right? It's like moving Carnegie from Pasadena or something, right? It's, it's hard. Yeah. So we had a question online from Alicia Weinberger. Um, she was just wanted to get a better sense of uh, how much could mines really mitigate the light they produce, produce if they fully implement you know, shielded lighting, uh, the amber lights, how big of an effect does it really make? I think it's pretty important uh, so the, the shielding, most of them already do. Uh, the you know the color of the light, the spectral restrictions, they're important. But I think the most important thing they can do, which is not part of the law, but it might be get required as part of a mitigation strategy, has to do with like active control of lighting, right? So one of the main pro so artificial light at night, illumination in general in the globe it has like a really, really bad design problem, which is that most of the places we illuminate at night are not used by human beings, okay? So 
the amount of photons that we emit that actually make it into a human being's eyes uh, is, I don't know what the fraction is, but it's you know several orders of magnitude less than minus one, okay? So I don't know, 10 to the minus whatever, minus whatever you want, probably the size of the Planck time or scale, right? Yeah, we emit photons, right? right? And, and we illuminate parking lots and streets, et cetera, and, and where there's no people working or walking. Uh, and I think the mines could mitigate their impact enormously if they implemented active control systems for lining, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, if you have a road on which, the, I don't know, a 10 kilometer road in which trucks need to drive, you know, mineral, you know, you only need lights when the trucks are going by, right? Or maybe the lights are on the truck and not all over the road, right? you know, things like that. Okay. Any last questions? No, let's thank Guillermo again. Thank you. Yes, sir.